Okay. Uh, PowerPoint. There we go. <laughs> so welcome to the third in the installments of the um, sort of the reports at Canyon Learners Commission at Michael Barber and Joelle Nagel, who unfortunately couldn't be here. So you got something came up uh, for her today. So she had to uh, bow out. So you get me at the controls um, for this. This is the third report, which is the longest, uh, which you have a pre-publication link that was provided to you. And, and Michael, if you don't mind, can you drop that pre-pub link into the text chat? Um, so that uh, it's there, we're gonna publish, we're waiting for one more uh, vignette to come in. So we're gonna publish onto the Candy Learn site afterwards. But this is the voices. So in the first couple of reports uh, that we started with, uh, we started with, with the, um, with the, the sort of the picture about what was announced. And we're going to follow the same format as we did in the previous webinars, is that trying to do some insights uh, as well, uh, a little bit that we'll share. And then feel free to ask questions about any of the, the places. So interrupt at the time when it's there, text chat, and we'll, we'll monitor the text chat as well. And then we'll leave some options uh, at the end for discussion. Don't know if we'll take the full hour. It, you know, we're not going to uh, take some time, but Anyway, we'll see, we'll see where we go with this. So just a little bit of a context is that we did originally look at the spring uh, expectations that were published and announced by the different ministries uh, in the provinces and territories. So just because they didn't announce something doesn't mean that it didn't happen, uh, but it's just whatever was published, we were, we were scraping off the websites uh, as well to see that. So again, as we know, there was attendance was expected uh, in some level in schools uh, where they could afford it. Uh, then the lockdown happened and then they said, oh, don't worry, your grades don't count. You're all gonna pass. And of course that went click as we remember. Although some schools did go, uh, some provinces did open their schools back. I think Quebec and BC were the ones uh, two, and there were some isolated other ones. Michael, was there any others that you recall off the top of your head that opened up? And so it, it, that was in, in sort of the May and June area. Um, so lots of trepidation, lots of concern. While then, of course, as we know, in September, that just reared its head again with regards to that. So, but for the most part, the focus remained on being certain in school. Some had delays. Uh, uh, Ontario and BC of note, uh, Saskatchewan as well, for staggering in terms of entry, but others typically just tried to launch the year, the school year, the same. So, you know, when you look at what we, this is what we went over in the last session as well, but you know, I highlighted fully in class, fully in class, fully in class, just some exceptions to that. The other exception was obviously some degree of remote learning uh, was in consideration. But quite frankly, we didn't find as many that actually had some specific training skills and ramp up uh, in a general sort of province or territory wide approach. They were relying on the skill sets or the uh, approaches that were used in the spring because the focus was all on physical distancing, on cleanliness, on getting kids into school, about lineup. So, and you remember what the media was a bit like, it, certainly at that time. But for the most part, the focus stayed straight into on class uh, in the context. So, you know, what we heard about and the discussion was about masks. So students, you know, basically were wearing masks when they were in places where they couldn't be in their pods or their, their cohorts or their bubbles. Um, and then remote learning basically had some announced specific skill building initiatives, but, but not a lot of focus. The, the, the all eggs went into the basket called school. Um, and then they reduced cohorts. So there was this, uh, in the secondary thing, there was a quadmester kind of approach where basically two classes, two courses, uh, lots of information in context about that, what students found uh, that we can talk a little bit about the impact of that. And then shifting to hybrid. So there was even, we noted, there was a, some boards that were saying that they wanted teachers to teach from their classroom as well as remote online students simultaneously at the same time. So interesting things that were happening, but against the backdrop of this, you can see the September on the left and then of course, December on the right, we all know what happened. Okay, this is December 1st from, and where did you source these ones, Michael? I've 
Uh, it's the Health Canada website. I can drop the link in the uh, chat there. Okay. Terrific. So, so this is the stories from the folks that contributed, uh, and we can talk a little bit about the the methodology of that as well and how they were selected. It, it, this is not a systematic uh, data collection structure that we use. This was going out and sort of fishing for stories is, is what we did. So if you wanna speak to that a little bit, Michael, is you can sort of read what the summary says there, but the real story is that we just kind of tapped into our networks. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's basically it. Uh, you know, we first reached out to the board of uh, the Canadian eLearning Network, as well as former board members, um, and also asked them to pass it along to their networks to see, particularly we were really actually concerned about making sure we had a lot of student and parent voices. And because our own networks outside of immediate families were mostly teachers and school leaders and and district leaders and those kind of things it was really important for us to get those two groups um, and from that we basically then started looking at some of our own personal networks folks that we knew um, in some cases we would see something in a news item and uh, just think that they were you know providing a little bit of a different perspective so we would uh, cold call them and reach out to them. Uh, we did the same thing with a couple of folks on who, you know, have been active on social media about um, their experiences with the way things have rolled out in the fall and cold called them as well. Um, and we were really trying to be careful as well to make sure that at least for each of the categories, we were trying to have some sort of representation across the country that we were not being overly reliant upon one jurisdiction or one individual program. Um, probably our biggest detriment in, in doing that uh, was the fact that we weren't able to get anyone from uh, Northern Canada. Um, all of our contacts that we were there, um, we were striking out with, uh, I think partly because in many of the territories, COVID and the restrictions around COVID hadn't been much of an issue until about the time we started to recruit for this. Uh, when the, they were finally hit, um, uh, like it's only been this past month that uh, Nunavut has had any cases whatsoever, as an example. Um, so our timing was just a little off there. And because of that, we don't have uh, a single vignette from north of 60. Yeah, and I think the part of the other reasons why uh, some flooded in and others didn't is that we find ourselves in a state of um, chaos or not. Uh, and the, the, the thing that happens, and I see it a lot, and probably others may have experienced it, what's happened in the era of COVID is the balance uh, is not there, and some get completely overwhelmed, and others we hear about being bored stiff, and there's, there's either on or off, it seems to be, there is no in between, so I think most of who we went to, to ask were in that latter category. So this is what we landed with. So uh, we talked about specifics in here, but you know, basically, Michael, we got a bit of a mix across. And so this also doesn't include a number of uh, vignettes that we received that we didn't put in the publication for a variety of reasons. Uh, one, we got a flood of parents from one particular uh, province through connections there. Uh, but to be fair to those who put the, those together, we're going to feature them as blog posts as well so that they will see uh, the light of day in publication and we'll highlight those blog posts in our communications as well. Uh, and there is a, a couple of others that um, you know, had a specific point that we're arguing a little bit more of a, a shall we say, a perceived issues that may not be representative across the rest of the province. So again, we'll publish them uh, independently, but they didn't come in the report. We're trying to get a sort of a holistic overview. Anything else on that, Michael? Uh, no, okay. So so what, what was said? So I had the opportunity in, uh, to read through all of these and try to find some themes. So you're not getting any sort of, you know, methodological data analysis structure. You're just getting, you know, the biases and, the selective views that I have as I went through. But the student ones were kind of fun. 
So, so some of the things that, that came out were like procrastination and isolation is, you know, that lack of interactions, too many things to remember to do. So again, this dichotomy of I'm bored stiff, but now I got all this crap I have to do from school. Um, so the other thing about pace, which was interesting, it was like completely all over the board in terms of what the students were writing about, either completely bored or completely overwhelmed. Uh, you know, it was too fast, too slow. And it speaks to the needs around each individual learner needs something specific and different. And so how do you manage that? And what a lot of people defaulted to in remote learning was just one size fits all, that's all I got, that's all I can give, which really isn't how online learning is designed at all, but that's what happened in pandemic. Uh, and then in terms of, you know, basically, as we know, the social emotional well-being of, of the children that are in this situation are really, really the primary importance. And, you know, that came through as well with others to look at the fact that, you know, being in the school building, being around other adults, as well as their peers, is a really important part of the whole socialization and learning and growing up. And that context is really, really important. So it can't be understated. So this is the actual quotes from some of the, the, the students themselves. You know, this is how one described the experience. Another one was quite thoughtful and reflective, uh, you know, came to the conclusion that you got to, you know, a lot of good experience comes from bad experiences. <laughs> so, you know, the wisdom that is comes in there, you have to, you end up somewhere positive afterwards. So it's kind of nice to see in this particular person, the individual that there's that glass half full kind of uh, approach. And then this one was just bizarre and random. And I thought it was just hilarious. So you have to read that one. This is obviously a younger student who was asked to write down what their experience was like. <laughs> obviously in a lockdown situation. So just randomly doing things, which is kind of interesting. I think we all remember that time, what we had years and years ago. Some of the teachers, uh, obviously we're talking a lot about practice, which is really important to read uh, through with some of the sharings and the vignettes. But you know, the, the one that struck me was, was a teacher who reflected that the, they, she taught in a classroom in last year. So in, and it was in British Columbia. So she was in a, a classroom with students in elementary in, in May, June. And then she was teaching online in an online school. And so she said that what drove me was keeping track and keeping in mind those four uh, philosophies, or I would say, you know, um, sort of orientations, looking to equity, engagement, excellence, and empathy. So I thought those were kind of worth sharing. They're very interesting. Um, around pace, what was interesting about this is uh, there was, and this was a teacher that was in some rural remote areas in terms of uh, also working in with indigenous communities and found that driving paper pencil stuff and print materials to the students was the best strategy that worked because they tried, she tried a jump drive uh, and, and sending it out and, and the, the, then found afterwards that was in the spring, they, they didn't use it. So she just jumped in the car and drove, you know, physically distanced, dropped off the packages, and then talked to them about how to get through and work with it. So that was the level of, of you know, what they did, which was great. Um, and it worked, but it was totally normally conventional and unromantic when it comes to the online things. Um, but then probably what most of the things that happened is the eyes were on the announcements, the health protocols, the, the need for smaller class sizes, more effective cleaning protocols. There was a lot of fear, as we all know, and still is in for teachers in terms of that. And mask mandates are not, and we've followed that in social media, but that, that was part of behind the, the in the commentary. Um, so this was from a teacher that, that knew sort of early, and this is from an online school. So it's a really a focused program that is designed that way, but really emphasizing the difference between being in sort of the content delivery marking, the marker mode of sort of a correspondence model, is that really you're creating so many different interactions in so many different spaces, it's really important. Um, the other comment was from a, a teacher who, again, also uh, was teaching in uh, an online school, so, and, and had some experience in the classroom, obviously. 
but understanding uh, the, the differences was really important when they were trying to balance between kids being in a class as well as being online. Uh, and again, back to the online teacher about having some, some limits because online schools got flooded as, as many of you know that we were teaching online. Um, but this was, this was a quote from a teacher that was actually, uh, dare I say, it was in Newfoundland and with very little change or disruption because of COVID to what was happening in their classroom. Yet, yet pandemic fatigue, this is the comment about pandemic fatigue. So, and the teacher realized uh, was, I was in the best of situations relative to the rest of the people in the country. He says, I got pandemic fatigue. You know, we, we were relatively safe. We still went about our business pretty much the same, but even then, so it was kind of interesting. And, and I'm not sure it was the same teacher or another one that said, look, <laughs> we could, we're barely making it to the Christmas break. We got to recharge. <laughs> and I think if, if you know, some of the provinces are talking about maybe extending the break, I don't think you're going to get a lot of argument out of teachers <laughs> on that one. So what did the leaders focus on? What did they say? Well, they felt responsible for creating and doing what they needed to do with their programs. So the, one of the phrases that was used by uh, Michael Kennewell was nimble and alert. Uh, so be, you gotta be able to be ready to pre be prepared and respond uh, quickly in these situations to help uh, work, uh, support teachers and help teachers in terms of changing their pedagogy and their practices. Um, the other thing against this was the issues in schools about how do you allocate resources and personnel? I mean, it was just a nightmare to try to figure out and, and, I, and this is my pet peeve. You can see what I think of in terms of the word pivot. There's no way in education that we take this ship, the freighter that's going, you know, burdened with everything and the, all the world's troubles and you turn it. it. It just doesn't work that way. And so I, I really have a, an exception to the term. You just don't pivot to be online because online is based on a whole set of experiences and takes time to develop that practice. In the same way it took me a long time to develop my practice in a classroom, as I'm sure many of you experienced as well. So, uh, but schools were expected to do that, like just change everything right now. And we got a little bit more of a, because parents were more active and involved, there was a little bit more of a consumer attitude towards schooling. And a lot of parents just made choices. And, and many of them you'll hear in the, the discussions uh, in their, their vignettes uh, that they chose for options that weren't part of public education. But what does come through, and I, this is my phrase, a deadly game of dodgeball with COVID um, is because it was chaotic, that things bounced around, things changed. So go back to that nibble and alert. Uh, it was nice to think that you could be, but it's very difficult. Uh, as a result, there was a lot of, exhaustion as well within our leaders uh, in there. So what did they say? Um, never before have we needed to focus on social and emotional learning much, much more, mindfulness. Uh, transitioning uh, online is complex. This is where some that never had done it before, then they began to realize this is really not a simple thing to do. Um, but also trying to get ahead, leaders are like trying to look ahead and down the road, impossible almost to plan. Um, and so, but there was a lot of assurance or, or reluctance to do doomsday a forecast and plan for it. Some did, some didn't. And then lastly, in terms of what they're feeling, again, the exhaustion, but despite all of that, many of them saw some great changes that started to happen in their schools, in their school districts. So there was a positive lining to this. And that's what I think when we come out of the pandemic, that's what we really want to leverage. So this is the voices of some others. This is a parent. Um, and I thought it was interesting. I pulled this out because uh, she talked about Zoom school, but uh, said that students, including her, but specifically her children, needed individual small group sessions to establish rapport and engage. And that's where we saw success as well in, in that. Another one said, never understood the value of being in a classroom until now, that how important it was for that emotional connection to be in the school, despite the fact that there was a risk. And this was a parent that had some uh, health concerns and they saw that the social emotional needs outweighed the potential 
for the, the health issues. Uh, and then another a comment um, about starting a virtual school from scratch. And this was in a school division that didn't have that virtual school in place and literally just not did remote learning, but actually created a whole online school for their elementary students. Uh, just over the, started in August and got it launched for September. And it's going relatively well. So interesting things to come. So a couple of other voices that was there. Um, is this is from a, a, the trustee, uh, one of the trustees, hopefully he said that we'll have to, um, did not expect so many underprivileged families to choose remote learning because of the susceptibility and multi-generational families, but also uh, just, you know, because of the need. So it was an interesting observation in an urban area. Um, and again, we saw from other voices about the social emotional benefits that came for, from being in there and that the, no substitute for human connection. It's really possible, but it can be generated and done online. And for those of us that have been working online, we understand that. And it's nice to hear it come out of the voices of some of the others. So when I think in terms of uh, this, um, you know, this is the, the fear one. I'm hoping that we can leverage some of these experiences now to push our experiences online and good pedagogy and practices you know, into the future so that we actually come out of COVID and we can look back at it. And we can say, look, as much as it was crazy and it was really challenging, look what we have because of it. And that's the same thing now with the investments in infrastructure uh, as well. In some of those rural and remote areas that were, you know, political promises to increase connectivity is actually happening. There are actually investments being made and it is being rolled out at a much more accelerated rate. So we can look back at this and we can see some things did get done as a result of that. So we've thrown everything obviously into the, the site here, which um, on here, so, and I'll put the link back in, but uh, at this point in time, we just kind of want to take and see questions and answers. So I'll stop uh, sharing so we can get some discussion and dialogue going. Did you want to stop the recording at this stage as well? Uh, yes, I do. Thank you for that.